I invite you to turn in your Bibles tonight to the book of John, chapter number 16. We have been trying to follow the Lamb, whithersoever He goeth in His earthly ministry. But tonight I want to get out of that and look at a subject that I don't want to pass over. And it is the subject of the ascension. <clears throat> the subject of the ascension. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ would have no meaning without the ascension. So we come to see that the Gospels present Jesus as past. Everything in the Gospel was that which he did while he was here on earth. <clears throat> But in the epistles, after the ascension, we have Christ presented in present and future. So we need to go on and see what the Lord has to say concerning the ascension. Now, you don't hear any messages just on the ascension. We often preach mostly on death, burial, and resurrection. And it's because there is tied up with the resurrection, the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's hard to just pull out the ascension. So I can't do it and I'm not going to try. I'm just going to use the verses as they are in your Bible and see what God has to say uh, to us tonight. Our title is in John 16:7. It is expedient. <clears throat> but we shall begin reading in John 16 and verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. That really is important. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, Whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. I'd always thought that word expedient, just out of my own mind, meant that it was absolutely essential and necessary. And while it does that, that's not truly the meaning that the word uh, denotes in the scriptures. Uh, if you'll look at Matthew 5:30, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 30, I'll show you this word, Greek word translated differently in English. <clears throat> Matthew 5:30. I'll let you read the three words, if you don't mind. Matthew 5, 30. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for... That's the word, expedient. So we find out that it's profitable for you that I go away. Yes, it's essential, but what we come to find out, this word more leans towards it is to your advantage look at Matthew 18 and verse 6 and you still get three words Matthew 18 and verse number 6 but whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me so your words have been, it is profitable in Matthew 5.30, 
and it were better in Matthew 18, 6. So the word expedient means it is more advantageous to you. Yes, it still means it's essential. It's got to be. Can't, you can't do it any other way. It's going to happen. But the word actually means I'm doing this for your profit, for your advantage, and so things will be better for you. So let's finish reading that seventh verse of John 16. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now in John 14, 26, it says the comforter is going to be the one to bring to your remembrance the things that I taught you. Brother Ed and I were talking before church tonight and we're saying that everything that the apostles needed and the Christians needed after his death and prior to his resurrection, Jesus had told them everything. There wasn't anything left out. He instructed them about everything that was going to happen to him, but they didn't remember. So the Holy Ghost is coming to bring to your remembrance because he said, I, these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. And you didn't need them, so you didn't really listen. But the Holy Spirit's going to come now with my absence, and you're going to desire to see a day of the Son of Man, but you're not going to have me back again ever. But the Holy Spirit is going to do more for you in my absence than I could do in my presence. And when He has come, He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He shall convince or convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. All right, what is sin that the Holy Spirit convicts of? Failure to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Of sin because they believe not of me. Now, what about righteousness? It's not going to be morality anymore. It's not going to be the works of the law. You're going to have to attain to a holiness as God is holy. Be ye therefore holy as I am holy. How are you in the world you're going to get that? The Holy Spirit shall convince you of righteousness and would you read me the next phrase in John 16, 10 of righteousness? Because I go to my Father. You're not going to have righteousness if Jesus doesn't ascend. Yeah. Righteousness can only be had by imputation. What does that mean? God has to place it on the inside of you. How does he do that? Well... He only places righteousness in those whose sins they have, he has placed in Christ. For he hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us in order that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So the Holy Spirit will convince of righteousness because Christ goes back to the Father and you see me no more. The righteousness comes by the Holy Spirit bringing you the application of that which Jesus did on earth. So he has to go away. Let me say it again. The Gospels present Christ past. The epistles present Christ present and future. Therefore, he has to go back to the right hand of the Father for the church to be able to go on and be able to walk on in that which God has got provided for him. Do you remember what John said as he saw him walking down the beach that morning in John 1, 29? Behold, the Lamb of God. How is he designated Lamb of God? Which... Take us away the sin of the world. Now, if he is designated the Lamb of God because he's going to take away the sin of the world, then what do you call him once the sin of the world has been taken away? Did he not say in John 19.30, it is finished? Yep. Was not God the Father satisfied when he saw the travail of his soul? Yes. Now, how do we look at him? Look at Revelation chapter 5.
Revelation chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 4. John is a representative man. He represents the church at that age, weeping because he don't know what to do. The veil of the temple is torn in two. The priesthood is over and done with. All, every prophecy has been fulfilled. Jesus preached it in Luke 24, twice to the two on the road to Emmaus and once in the upper room. All of the things concerning him in the Psalms and prophets and so forth. And so now he's weeping because he don't know which way to go. What do we do now? Everything we had is gone. It's fulfilled. It's completed. Verse 4. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold the lion. Heaven's going to start calling him the lion instead of the lamb. Now, why is he called the lion now instead of the lamb? Keep reading. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he hath what? Prevailed. prevailed. He hath prevailed. He has fulfilled all righteousness. It is completed. He, we call on him to come and to rid the world of sin. And when he was there, he's called the Lamb of God. If you need a man to dig a well for you, once the water's flowing, goodbye, Mr. Well Digger. We don't need you anymore. Why? We got what we wanted. He's the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. So that was Jesus' past. But presently and future, we need to see him after his resurrection and ascension to understand what he does for you. Can you uh, pay attention while I read you a long quote? I never could. Preachers started reading quotes from books. I said, mm -hmm, there's a bee, there's a wolf. You know, I wonder what they're going to do tomorrow. You know? I wonder if there's any watermelon left. ISBE, International Bible Standard Encyclopedia. Listen at how busy Jesus is in the present and the, and the future days for the church. I am quoting you from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia on the word ascension. We may summarize what the New Testament tells us of our Lord's present life in heaven. What is Jesus doing now? By observing carefully what is recorded in the various passages of the New Testament. Prove my point. It's scattered throughout the New Testament. It's like eating those walnuts that used to grow on the tree in your yard. They got more wood than they have meat. Now, some of you is grinning. We used to have to get Mama's bobby pin and get a little bit of meat out. That's how this is. Listen. He ascended into heaven, Mark 16, 19, Luke 24, 51, Acts 9, 1, 9. He is seated on the right hand of God, Colossians 3, 1, Hebrews 1, 3, 8, 1, 10, 12. He bestowed the gift of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, Acts 4, 9, and 33. He added disciples to the church, Acts 2, 47. He worked with the disciples as they went forth preaching the gospel, Mark 16, 20. He healed the impotent man, Acts 3, 16. He stood to receive the first martyr, Stephen's. Acts 7, 56. He appeared to Saul of Tarsus. 9, Acts 9, 5. He makes intercession for his people. Romans 8, 26. Hebrews 7, 25. He is able to succor the tempted. Hebrews 2, 18. He is able to sympathize. Hebrews 4, 15. He is able to save to the uttermost. Hebrews 7, 25. He lives forever. Hebrews 7, 24. Revelation 1, 18. He is our great high priest. Whole bunch of stuff. He possesses an intransmissible or involatable priesthood. In other words, they can't give it over to anybody else. Hebrews 7, 24. He appears in the presence of God for us. Hebrews 9, 24. He is our advocate with the Father. 1 John 2, 1. He is waiting until all opposition is overcome. Hebrews 10, 13. And this includes all the teaching of the New Testament concerning our Lord's present life in heaven, unquote. I wouldn't be so bold to say, and I didn't miss one, but they said that contains all of the Lord's work in heaven. A lot of stuff, isn't it? Yeah. 
Now, where would you be if Jesus had not ascended? The ascension is essential. It, it, it has to be coupled with the resurrection. Paul said, if Christ was not raised, we we're still in our sin. But it, he is including raised and ascended to the right hand of the Father to be the mediator for us. Now, we were reading in Revelation 5, the line of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seals. He hath prevailed, past tense. He's done what he was supposed to be. Now, heaven is looking at him as the line of tribe of Judah. You say, but yeah, but Brother Gene, read the next verse. No, no problem. Revelation 5, 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, and uh, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. You ever seen a lamb like that? Okay, church, for your benefit to keep you from weeping and to know that what Jesus did on earth at that time is applicable and uh, is that which provides for you in the present and the future and, uh, and throughout all eternity. Okay, you can look at him as lamb, but you got to look at him as a lamb with horns. A lamb with all, uh, uh, that is all powerful. That is with, with seven eyes. That is all, all perception and understanding and all knowledge. The seven spirits sent forth into all the earth. He is that which diversifies the work of the Holy Spirit into every aspect of the church down through all the ages unto all the people that ever get saved. That's a different kind of lamb than behold the Lamb of God take away the sin of the world. Flip over one page. Revelation 6, 16. When I stop, would you finish it just to make sure you get it? Revelation 6, 16. And, he, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb. You ever seen a mad lamb? <laughs> Something different here, folks. Henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet henceforth know we him no more. 2 Corinthians 5, 15 and 16. Touch me not, Mary Magdalene, because I have not yet ascended to my Father in your mind. You have got to come and approach me now in this time between the resurrection and the ascension you got to approach me as if I have already ascended. I am not the same fellow sitting at the coffee table at Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house drinking coffee and talking with y'all. He's different now. And go tell my brothers that I will ascend to my Father. I don't want them approaching me without them understanding. Now, think about it. Go home, get your Bibles out, and don't read anything but the passages that have to do with Jesus' appearance to the, to the disciples after his resurrection. And you will find an entirely different relationship and an entirely different Jesus than the one before his death and burial and resurrection. He doesn't stay with them all the time. He comes and goes. He appears in the middle of a room. He has bread and fish on the fire for him. He, he knows where they are and what they're doing, but he just ain't really buddy-buddy with them. He's now Lord. And you've got to approach him different. The ascension is something that really needs to be thought about. And I really do wish you would, and not let it slip off your mind, please. Go home and read the passages about Jesus after his resurrection. And see how different he acted towards the apostles. So we see that he's different. The wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? So we come to understand Jesus in an entirely different way. John 7, 39. <clears throat> John 7, 39. He had just said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe into him 
were about to receive, the interlinear reads, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Why? Because that Jesus, Jesus was, was not yet glorified. glorified. Yeah. The waters of the Holy Ghost, the life, the living waters weren't flowing through anybody yet. But they would. Why were they not flowing through anybody yet? Because Jesus was not yet glorified. What does it mean that Jesus was not yet glorified? He wasn't ascended and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. It was the ascension that was essential for this to take place. Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. I love these verses. I don't know that I've really gave, given that much attention to them. The last two verses in the book of Mark. You can turn to Luke chapter 1 and back up two verses if you want to, if that's the way you can find it. <clears throat> Mark 16, 19 and 20. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. When did Jesus become Lord of all? When he ascended. Now, Schofield won't allow that, and a lot of Baptists won't allow it. They're not going to have Jesus to be crowned and enthroned as Lord until they get there. But guess what? They ain't going to get there unless he's Lord now. Amen. All right. Now, listen at verse 20. And they who, the church, went forth and preached everywhere. Would you read me the next phrase? And they went forth and preached everywhere. How do you like them apples? Just because he ain't here don't mean he ain't working with us. Didn't I read you all that stuff that you, I didn't see a single one of you go to sleep. When I read you all that stuff with all those verses about what Jesus is doing presently in his glory now. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. And what do you say with that? Amen. Amen. Isn't that good? Let me ask you something. When you pray, in whose name do you seek acceptance with the eternal essence of God? Jesus. The Son of God, the Lord Jesus. We don't have access to God except through Him. Everything we have is because He is at the right hand of God at this moment. Now, his ascension is the pattern of our regeneration. Look at Ephesians 2, 6. You say, well, I got saved. What does that mean? Well, a lot of folks, it just means they joined the church. No, I, that won't get it. You can be a church member and go to hell. What does it mean? I got saved. What does that mean? If you mean that there was a new birth, then there was a raising you up from a world consciousness that your natural birth presented you into a grace and God consciousness by a spiritual birth. Now, where are you? In Ephesians 2, uh, verse, uh, verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened, made us alive together with Christ. By grace are you saved, listen, and hath raised, is that past, present, or future? Past tense. If you're saved, you're already raised up together with Christ and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I've been trying to tell you for 11 to 2 years a Christian is not a man on earth looking towards heaven. A Christian is a man in heaven looking back towards the earth. He has a God consciousness. He has a spiritual mindedness. His regeneration is his ascension with Christ into a heavenly consciousness. Isn't that something? Look at Colossians 3. And verse number one. 
Colossians 3 and verse number 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, wait a minute, Paul, what are you talking about? Man, I ain't even dead yet. I know what he's talking about. Listen, read on. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth, for ye are dead to the world, dead to the natural life, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is now presently our life, when he shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. In verse 4, he's talking about the resurrection and your glorification. In verse number 1, he's talking about your regeneration. Regeneration is a resurrection and ascension into the presence of Almighty God. Do you have a God consciousness? You didn't get that from Adam or your granny. If you have a God consciousness and you are aware of the things of the Lord, you didn't get that from religion. You got it from Jesus Christ. Flip back one page and look at Philippians 4 and verse 20. Make that 3 and verse 20. <clears throat> Philippians 3 and verse 20. For our conversation, anybody know what that really means? Yes. Manner of life, right? 1611 word. For our manner of life is where? In heaven. In heaven. But not only do we have a heavenly consciousness, why did Joseph not lay with Potiphar's wife. He said, somebody is watching me and I got to give an account to him. He had a heavenly consciousness. He knew he had to give an account to God. But the rest of the verse says, from whence, from heaven, we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body. The Holy Spirit does not seem to think that it's wrong to be talking about spiritual regeneration as an ascension and resurrection and go right on into with just a, a, a semicolon into the physical resurrection at the end of the age. You see it's all wrapped in together. That's one of the reasons it's hard to study the ascension. Acts 111. <clears throat> Acts 111. The ascension is not only a pattern of our regeneration, but it is the pattern of Christ's return. Are you ready? The disciples have gone out to the edge of the city. Jesus has gone up in a cloud, verse uh, 9, in their sight. They're still standing there gawking up, looking steadfastly towards heaven, and then two angels appear. And listen what they say. Two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Now, give me the, the, the next three words. Yes. All right. How did he leave? Identified, known, realized as Jesus of Nazareth, a literal person. Now, that same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven. Now finish the verse. His ascension is the pattern for his return. How did he ascend? By the power of God. How did he ascend? As a literal, physical human being. How did he ascend? Identified by the church as Jesus identified by, this, by heaven as this same Jesus shall come in like manner, this same Jesus in like manner. The ascension is essential to understand so that you can believe and understand and perceive the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. How is he going to come back? Well, how did he go? Isn't it amazing? 
God is amazing. Matthew 24, 30. Matthew 24, 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now the clouds of heaven, I believe two ways. I believe clouds, like puffy, you know, vapor majigger things up there. It looks like a bunch of marshmallows hanging around. Uh, or uh, That kind of cloud. But I believe it's also what he's saying here, clouds of, glo of glory. So his, it's, it's presenting to you that which he left in is that which you can expect him to come back with. Matthew 26 and verse 64. I didn't know Matthew 26 had 64 verses. It don't. It has 75. Matthew 26, 64. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. How did he leave? They said a cloud received him out of their sight. How's he coming back? The cloud's going to bust open and let him come back through. The ascension is a pattern of his return. Revelation chapter 1. Verse 7. I wish you would be thinking, Brother Gene, you are just running us all over the Bible. And then I would say, I told you at the beginning we're going to have to run all over the Bible. That it's hard to find. Some of y'all must not eat them black walnuts we used to get off of trees. You don't even know what I'm talking about, do you? Had to smash them suckers with a hammer, and then you just picked up tiny little old bits of black wall. Had enough wood in there to build a fire, but you didn't get much black wall. That's the way it is. You just have to search this thing out. All right? Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 7. Behold, he cometh with what? Clouds. How did he leave? Clouds. With clouds. Revelation, I mean, Acts chapter 1. Verses 9 and 10 and 11. Listen. He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. So we see that the Lord Jesus Christ, in his ascension, is preparing us to receive him in his second coming. I'm going to give you one. You don't have to turn to it. I ain't going to tell you what it is till after I read it to you. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. I'll let you rest on that one. That's Ephesians 14. All right. Now, John 3.13. The next thing. This is impossible for a human being. This is po impossible for a man. I'm not talking about the God man. I'm talking about me and you. You'll understand it when I read you the verse. John 3, 13. And no man hath what? Ascended. Ascended up to heaven. You got that? But he that came down from heaven even the Son of Man, which is in, is in heaven. Now, you take that home and put it in your pipe and smoke it. He came from there, or he wouldn't have been able to go back to there, because you can't come back from a place you never have been. But right then, he was in heaven. Wow. That's a bigger God than most folks got, in it? But I want you to notice the first three words. And no man. How are you going to get to heaven? Well, let me ask you this. Where is heaven? You got your garment out there in your car, your Tom Tom or whatever you call them things. You got your GPS. Well, type in heaven. You know, I don't know the zip code. You'll have to call the post office. 
how are you going to get there? No man can go there. If God don't come and get us, we're not going to make it. But he has to be there before us. I think preachers and religion has really robbed the people of America for many, many years. They get up there and read, I go to prepare a place for you. And every one of them says, oh, he was a carpenter's son. He's up there building. Oh, man. Lord, please let me shoot him. You know, and let me have it. Let me have his time to get up there and preach. If he's going to lie on you, listen. I go to prepare a place for you. He said, that where I am, where is that? Where that is, that's heaven. There ye may be also. He was going to the cross to prepare you a place. And I like those words, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care whether there's grass or concrete or asphalt. It don't make a particle of difference to me whether we can fly or not fly or whether, you know, there's a cabin in the corner of Glory Land or mansions or what. I don't care. I just will be without sin and will be in a perfect, how do I say it, condition to worship the Lord for the first time. That's heaven. And that's what he's preparing for us. And as the brother used to say, ain't God good. All right, John 3.13, no man can. All right, Acts chapter 2 and verse 34. What about the man after God's own heart? Well, you know, he might have made it. Ah, that said, and no man. Acts chapter 2 and verse 34. For David, King David, the man after God's own heart, the sweet psalmist of Israel, is two words. Not ascended. For David is not ascended into the heavens. But he saith himself, out of his own mouth, The Lord, all caps, said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. It's not me that the sovereign Lord received and drew Jesus Christ, the Lord, back into the heavens. It, 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 was, it was the Son of God, not me. David hath not ascended. No man can ascend. It has to be the Lord Jesus Christ. You just can't do it. Now, I've already preached this, but I'll add a little bit to it. <clears throat> you remember all that stuff I was saying back at the beginning about we don't call him lamb anymore. If we do, we see him with horns and we see him with wrath on a throne. I want you to understand this. Jesus Christ, now get, stay with me now, <clears throat> is Mike Conrad out there because I'm going to get clobbered with this. Don't tell him if he ain't there. Jesus Christ ascended in an entirely different state, but in the exact same body. That's the truth. John 27, John 20 and 17. You don't have to turn there. Touch me not. I am not yet ascended. Tell my brothers. They can't touch me either unless they touch me as being ascended. 2 Corinthians 5 and 15 and 16, we've already quoted that. Henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh. Henceforth know we him no more. He's the same Jesus, but he ain't in the exact same state. That's the truth. Well, let me ask you something. Do you still want to be sinful 
have a temper and be aggravating and upset with stuff when you get to heaven? No, I want to be perfect. Well, ta-da! Jesus is perfect too. He don't have to be lamb, um, excuse me, lamb to take away the sin of the world. He did that. God wouldn't have received him into heaven or even brought him out of the grave if he hadn't done it. And he's different after his resurrection, prior to his ascension. 1 Corinthians 15. Again, quote me right. What I said was, Jesus Christ ascended in a different state, but in the same body. Okay? If you'll just say, I said that, I don't mind. Then you throw rocks at me. 1 Corinthians 15, 35. <clears throat> but some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not made alive except it die. You can't take a roasting ear and go out yonder and stick it in the ground, inspect anything to happen but it rot. It's got to die. Have you ever seen grains of corn that have died on the ear? They don't look exactly like they did. They ain't all plump and juicy. Well, there's a difference. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest, next word, no. not that body that shall be, but you sow that bare grain, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. You see what I'm saying? I just backed up my statement by the word of God. Jesus Christ ascended in a different state, but in the same body. It's the difference between a, a grain of corn that's dead and one that's still on the roasting ear and ready to boil and have it at the barbecue. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. There's one flesh of men, of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies, heavenly bodies, and bodies terrestrial, earthly bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another of the glory of the stars, and one star different from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. What's the difference? It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. Jesus Christ was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with much grief. But he rose from the dead. And bless God, nobody in the world has seen him again and won't until every eye sees him when he comes back to bring judgment upon them. But ye see him by the Holy Spirit. Ain't God good? It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. I rest my case. Jesus Christ ascended in a different state but in the same body. We have to approach him. We have to approach him differently. Religion is teaching you to break all the spiritual rules and to form yourself a God of your imagination. And everywhere you look, we got picture Jesuses, statue Jesuses, movie actor Jesus's we got all kind of Jesus's except the real Jesus I was delighted when they gave me a little zip up Bible when I was a young man and it had pictures of Jesus in it <clears throat> but the Holy Spirit led me to the place to where I laid that aside and bought me a Bible with no pictures and no red letters in it because 
every bit of it is God's word, not just the red letters. Don't train me to do what Jehudi did with his pen knife in the winter house and cut off uh, uh, the prophet's letter and throw it in the fire. You can't just pick and choose what you're going to re receive or accept. It's God's word. And he said you need to cast down your imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the what? The knowledge of God. So I don't believe that I need to go to the whatever that chapel is. What is it, 16 chapels? I know it's 16. I'm just... And see that fella trying to touch his finger with the other fella and say, well, one of them's God and the other's who, Moses or somebody? I don't know who it is. No, I don't need to go see that. I got a better picture of God in my heart than he's got. That was Michelangelo. Well, this is the Holy Ghost. Top that if you can. You read me the book of Revelation chapter 1 and tell me what does Jesus look like. You're going to say, well, he's got hair like cotton, eyes like fire and a tongue like a sword and feet like brass. And a... You ever seen a man look like that? That's not a description of Jesus of Nazareth. That's a revelation of the glorious Son of God sitting on the right hand of God right now and everything, every part of him is there to reveal to you the sovereign glory of Christ. This religious world is going to hell just as fast as they can go, believing in a, in, 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 in a, in a Jesus that they fabricated out of their own imagination. Oh, my soul. It is expedient. It is expedient. Hmm. How much time do we have? Oh, it is expedient that I hurry. <laughs> His present state. We've already read Hebrews 1, 3. Let's read some of those verses that he is be referred to. What is his present state right now? It was years after I had been saved and even years after I had been called to preach that I found out that Jesus Christ is presently reigning Lord. And did you know when I found that out, I was so excited about it, but there was people that really did not like that because it messed up their whole system of, 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 of religious structure. But I just give them one verse, and I always give you one verse, same old verse. Let's start with verse 1, Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. God, who at sundry times, various times, and in different manners, he spake when? In time past. Spake to whom? The fathers. How? By the prophets. Now, that's in time past. That's in the Old Testament. Hath in these last days, when is that? That's in the New Testament economy. Spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. All right. Verse 3. His Son, being the brightness of the Father's glory, and the express image of his person. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And upholding all things by the word of his power. Jesus Christ sustains gravity, motion, life, weight, light, everything there is. His word sustains it. Now, when he had by himself done what? Three words. Where did he do that? On the cross. That's, that's the point God brings you to to make you understand when the next thing happened. When he had by himself purged our sins, then he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Some people's waiting to make Jesus Lord, and he's been Lord ever since he ascended. Ever since he purged our sins. Look at verse 7, Hebrews 1, 7. And of the angels, God the Father saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire, but unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. 
Holy Ghost shall convince the world of righteousness because I go to my Father. He's talking to an ascended, enthroned Son. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. He never said that to an angel, but he says that to his son. So the Lord God has given him a name above every name in this world and also in the worlds to come. Because he became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. 1 Peter 3, 22. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 22. Now, I'm going to tell you all something. I don't know whether it's going to uh, get through to you hard or not, but I'm going to tell you, and this will be a real benefit to you if you'll listen to me. When the devil gets to getting after you real hot and heavy, this is the verse you pull on him. You didn't hear it, did you? You don't care, do you? You don't believe the devil's going to get after you. One of these days, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna, you're gonna be in a mud hole, and the devil's going to be stomping you, and you're going to need something. You say, oh, man, I wish I'd have listened. Listen, this is the verse you need to quote to the devil when he is really de uh, destroying you. The last two words of verse 21 are, Jesus Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. I have quoted that to old Slewfoot time and time again, and it always works. That is a double-edged sword, and it makes him so mad. And I said, ain't nothing you can do about it. You can stop me all you want. You can shoot them fiery darts at me. You can cripple me, buckle me to my knees, give me anxiety attacks, make me think I ain't even saved. But I'll tell you one thing. You are under the authority of King Jesus, and I'm going to tell him on you. If you don't leave me alone, phew, he's gone. There it is. People who do not have... I ain't talking about a sovereign grace memorization thing of the Lordship of Christ. I'm talking about a, a personal faith that Jesus Christ is Lord now that works in your heart. People who don't have that are not able to war in the warfare of the spiritual realm. You just got a little goober headed Jesus. But not this Jesus. The ascension is essential in your warfare against Satan. Mm -mm -mm. I got so much stuff to get to, I can't get to it. The ascension of Jesus Christ empowers the church. Ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Acts 1.8. Acts chapter 7 and verse 55, when Stephen was being stoned, it empowered him to see what? Do you remember what he saw? It wasn't a vision. I mean, it wasn't just, you know, like a prophet sees a vision. He actually saw heaven open. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. I don't know exactly what that means. Acts seven fifty-five. But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven. Where is Jesus? At the right hand of the majesty on high. He looked steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. What is the glory of God? Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he says the words that Jesus prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. If you want to increase your power, you need to increase your understanding of the ascension of Jesus Christ, and you need to hold on to it just like you do, or maybe more so than you do the virgin birth. Well, we believe in the virgin birth. Yeah, I know. Everybody does. Everybody in religion. What about the ascension? How are you doing on that? Maybe you've been losing all these battles, and you got all this... 
depression and negativity and beat downness and you losing all these battles with the, with the forces of darkness because you ain't got a risen Lord. You don't have an ascended Lord. Why don't you ransack the Bible to find out about it and get your teeth into some meat and understand that Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of the majesty on, right, on high right now there to intercede on your behalf. Romans chapter 8 and verse 34. He empowers the church. You shall receive power after that. Oh, my soul, eyes of your, uh, of your understanding being enlightened. Ephesians chapter 1. Christ is, is our joy. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. Got too much stuff, folks. I ain't going to get to it. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. He, the ascension is our, is, is our joy. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you there at Thessalonica and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. That's their joy. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. And to you who are troubled, anybody troubled here? Rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven. You can't come from heaven if you ain't there now. With his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints. You need to invest something in the ascension of Christ, dear soul. Well, Daniel saw it in the visions in the night. One like the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory. Brought before the Ancient of Days. Unto him was given a throne and dominion and power. The everlasting dominion that shall never have any end. Psalm 24, we'll finish with this. It's just kind of like cutting it off in the middle, but maybe that'll help you end it yourself. When you get home, you study it out. Psalm 24. This is the generation of them that seek thy face. <clears throat> Verse 6. Who are they? They are those that cry, out, Lift up thy heads, O ye gates, gates of righteousness, Isaiah said. And be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord. Strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Pause and think about that, it says. Dear soul, he entered into the gates of glory and established righteousness for you sent forth the Holy Ghost to proclaim and convince the world of righteousness because he had gone back to the Father. And the Bible says there twice, the, how, what condition did he enter into the gates as king of glory? Ain't God good? There's a heap more. You can study it out. The ascension brings us to benefit from everything that his life, death, burial, and resurrection provided for us. <laughs>